name is Jenna. Um, I work with Degree Art and Contemporary Collective, and we're so excited to have you guys here tonight. And we have our first artist salon with Julie Bennett, who is the wonderful artist in residence. So we're gonna have her come out. Hi, everybody. Um, hope you're doing okay. Thank you very, very much for joining us. That is superb. And um, I've got five very exciting artists to introduce to you. Well, they're going to introduce themselves. Um, as you know, I'm a portrait painter and I'm here in residency at Bankside Hotel uh, for the next six weeks and I'm painting my art icons. So I shall introduce you to the wonderful Lucy. Hi, my name's Lucy and I go by the artist's name House of Lucy and I like to take these kitschy ceramics, ceramic figurines that you can find in junk shops and antique shops and I like to breathe new life into them. And next we have... Hi, I'm Inga Duplessy. I'm a, a figurative oil painter. Um, this is a print out of a much larger painting that we'll probably be discussing tonight. And very, very happy to be here. Hi, my name's Peter Robertshaw. I'm uh, a photographer, so I feel slightly the other one out uh, in this kind of August company of wonderful artists. So I kind of leech off their backs. And what I'm going to be talking tonight about is a series of uh, photographs that I'm doing about called Artists in Space. So it's artists in their homes or in their, their uh, working environment with some of their pieces of art. So trying to capture their inspiration in, in a photograph. And here's one of the wonderful artists who's much better than I am. <laughs> Hello, I'm Paula Stevens Hall and I I kind of make stuff up as I go along, and um, I'm sure we'll be talking a bit more about that later this evening. Hi, I'm Mark Waddell, and I'm a painter. I'm interested in people who have self-created um, alternative um, personalities to create themselves into icons, whether they're famous or not. Um, I'm currently painting a series of works based on Polaroids and pictures that I took on the London club scene back in the late 70s, early 80s. Thanks. All right, so we're just going to leave it to the artists to get started. Okay, guys, so um, the, the big pictures that uh, you sent me and I, I printed out, I thought we could use them as a starting point about how uh, the inspiration came to work with the idea that you, you're working with and and also what the overriding inspiration is about your whole practice of whether it, you know the, the piece that's that you're you've shown on screen is is that uh, a sort of typical thing that you work with um lucy should we chat about yours first i've actually brought um this one along with me today fantastic so he's he's called barnaby the actual name of the piece is All the Gear, No Idea. <laughs> and with this one in particular, I just thought there was such a sort of, sort of arrogance to his expression where he just knows everything, but he hasn't got a clue. Mm -hmm. And um, what Barnaby's decided to do is climb a mountain. And he's had absolutely no training whatsoever, but he's gone to Gucci to get his, his mountaineering jumper. He's gone to Christian Dior to get his little bag. And it's going to Vivian Westwood to get his mountaineering hat because this is actually a mountaineering hat. And that's <laughs> also Gucci hiking boots. And none of it is particularly practical for mountain climbing. So he gets uh, sore feet after just 15 minutes and has to come back down again. Um, so the inspiration was just that whole sort of slightly tongue in cheek um, where um, people who have got a little, maybe a little bit more money than sense will just throw money at something, and, you know, rather than actually learn um, a skill. And so what, what, what day was it? Do you remember when you suddenly thought, oh my God, I could paint on figurines that, that you sort of see, you know, like, the, you know, like my mum probably would have loved one of those in the 1980s and, and probably they were about 100 quid or something, you know, they were very expensive. Yeah, they still are. And, um, and so what made you think, I could give it a new contemporary twist? 
actually, I can remember the, the day, like it was yesterday, that I, I first actually saw the figurine. I thought, I really want to do something with this one. And I was in um, a charity shop in Norwood, and it was an, an, an Emmaus charity shop. And there was um, a lady with a big skirt, and she just had her hands up in front of her like this, and I just wanted to put a burger into her hands. <laughs> just spoke to me. So I went home and taught myself how to make a tiny burger from um, FIMO, which I use as my, my modelling medium. It's a bit like plasticine, so you can model with, model with it, and then pop it in the oven and it bakes hard. Okay. But there are YouTube tutorials on how to make tiny things with FIMO. So I was like, right, there's the bun and the lettuce and the thing. Um, make this burger, put it in her hands, um, a sort of drop of ketchup on the dress as well. And then um, someone bought that figurine from me, so it just started there. And now I just, I'm, addi I'm addicted. So do you, stop. Have you made figurines from scratch yourself? I haven't. That's no. something I'm yet to do, but I like using these figurines that already exist because yeah. it feels like we have a past and a history yeah. and a story. And maybe they're just not loved anymore, so I can take them and give them, give them a new life, yeah. and, they, and then they get loved. Okay. And because they've got a history to them as well, you're you're adding to that history. So you're creating like a, a new um, a new story about something that already existed. And it kind of strikes me there's a similarity with some of the kind of street art ideas that are going on as well, mm -hmm. uh, where people subvert kind of things that, that happened before. So yeah, I think it's great. But, but how do you stay on trend? Because I'm so amazed <laughs> that you know everything about fashion and that you like so so like i saw this guy on social media before you even sent it to me i think and i was like oh my god i've just watched the advert to do with north face and gucci like i love fashion i love uh, you know i don't know whether it's been we're, we're both graphic designers we have been in the past and uh, so i don't know whether we're youth cultures embedded in us yeah, possibly. Um, and, you know, I, I was aware that Gucci had done the new North Face thing, so I'm, I guess I'm really, I'm probably more excited about advertising than I am the main programme. And so, yeah, seeing that, like, how do you, how do you stay on trend with knowing what it, what it you know, what well, to it is, like Instagram is a really good source of inspiration because it all happens there. And it's so, it's so now, it's so immediate, and you know exactly what trends are happening. I mean, I'm not, I'm certainly not on top of my, my game in terms of knowing what's particularly happening at the moment. And I'm not even on TikTok yet. Yeah. So I'm going to have to change my ways and, and, and go yeah, there. Yeah, share with you, I think. Yeah. I believe in yes. the archives as well. You can just be tuned in to, to get a feeling, because fashion designers are like that, aren't they? They all come up with kind of a similar thing, uh, you know, for a season. Obviously, there's a bit of spying goes on, I imagine. But there is obviously a feeling in the air of these things that I think if you are a creative, you can pick up on. And are you always at the cutting edge? The next period would be the like the next season of fashion, or, or do you go back as well? I would say that she is, yeah. but I don't know what you I'd say. It's, all, it's always quite contemporary what I do because the fact is these figurines all look quite old fashioned. So I like that juxtaposition of them holding something or wearing something that you wouldn't do. You, you take a picture of them before you do before and after thing. Yeah, I don't. Them. I don't, and I should. Yeah. yeah I, I, I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I love it actually. I've got to start doing it so I can have my before and after, but I think I just get too excited. And <laughs> I have the piece and that's it. I just want to get going with it. Like, I, I'm starting to base all my fashion on your figure. So I'm like, <laughs> oh, is that Supreme's down here now? <laughs> Don't be a bond, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do, you, do, you, do you bake the figurine with the little hamburger? Yeah. Okay, so they can yeah. bake fine. Yeah, oh, okay. because these are the fried, because they're mostly made of porcelain. Yeah. They've been fired at really extreme okay. temperatures, and you actually oh, bake fine quite low, like 110 degrees. <coughs> so they're not paint? Of it, of it, it's the paint on it? Yeah, the paint's fine. The paint will bake as well. Oh, right. Yeah, okay. yeah. so I think, yeah, we think, because I had to. Um, do this in different stages, and he was in, in and out of the oven quite a few times. And I did wonder if any paint would be affected, but it's absolutely fine. And what about the stories before I How do you, how, you know, how do they come about? 
can't remember exactly the first one that I sort of attributed the story to, but suddenly I had this um, this compulsion to just give them this this story and it made the whole thing more real. And creates a connection with yeah, you. Yeah, definitely. And I, I will work on those stories for, for, for days sometimes and only stop when I'm completely satisfied. And it has to make me laugh. That's ultimately my, my goal. If, if, if it doesn't make me laugh, then I'll just I'll start again. But that and it's the story part of the work. Yes. So yeah. it's like, yeah. sorry. No, no, no. I, was, I just wonder how do you if somebody buys Barnaby, mm. to, is the story written now? Well, I do. No. I, I, this is another thing that I need to start doing because I do a certificate of authenticity, but I, I obviously would like to be able to provide that story as no. well because it is an important part of the piece. <clears throat> but it's all a, a sort of um, a, a learning process, and I need to start sort of collating like taking the pictures before and taking the pictures after. You need a photographer. Let's talk. Give me a card, But I think you know, I think Paul was right in the fact that the story is part of the piece and I think that I would want to buy the story with the piece. Yeah. And because of your graphic design background, you can easily you produce a beautiful documentation yeah. of the story yeah. with the story of the yeah. But also, it would it be interesting to hear what the what the person who bought it, what they what their take on the story yeah. was as well? Yeah. Just people can really read, perhaps from what you what you've intended for that. Someone might read something completely different into it, yeah. which could kind of spark off another idea. Or something. Yeah, which is fantastic. I'd yeah. actually really like that to happen. Yeah. yeah. Have you had interest from the brands themselves wanting you to do things? You mm -hmm. you are poking a little bit of fun at. Sometimes. Yes, um, and in terms of brands, and Adidas came forward um, to just uh, just yeah, just about two years ago, they got in touch because I've done so many figurines mm -hmm. with the three striped tracksuits and hoodies, um, and then they commissioned me to do some pieces for them, which they then put in their flagship store in Oxford. Right. So that was really that was it really looked cool. brilliant. Yeah. I went, I, just, well, I didn't see it. I was on saw it on social media, and it was fantastic. I had to paint the tiny. Treffle on a 24 piece tea set, so that was quite challenging <laughs> because I'm not very steady handed. I mean, you know, it's not it's not my um, my strongest point. So I was like, oh, God. Um, but I I do tag Gucci and Alessandro and Michelle in every single thing I do that's got Gucci in it, and I'm just hoping one day mm. you'll pick up the phone and say. Hello, Jesse. Yes, and let's collaborate. <laughs> 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 just wait for that. Yeah, exactly. yeah. It's going to happen. Yeah. And and so, so Peter, what about your piece? Um, so you you go to artist studios and you take photographs of the artists within their space. What? How did you come up with that idea? What What made you think? Oh, I want to photo. You know, like. I want to go and photograph artists. Well, where where did that come from? So basically, I want to photograph people. I'm not interested at all in landscapes or anything beautifully positioned and posed and lit and whatever. It's only with, really with people that you have every second is totally different to be there in the, the way they're interacting with the environment, the, the expression, <coughs> the movement, or whatever. And kind of, so I did, I've taken lots of photographs of people, uh, you know, even doing weddings and things like that. But I think weddings are fantastic because it's like somebody paying a hundred models to dress up for me <laughs> and then paying me to take them doing really bonkers things. And perhaps they, they don't get the pictures that they might have thought they were, or I don't supply those and keep those for myself. But um, the coming to artists, it was like, that, that sort of idea on steroids because there's so much going on. I mean, the environments that they're in, they in space, they know these are in uh, people's homes, and there's the, the, these are separate studio uh, locations, one or two. Um, but um, I, the way it sort of works is I kind of go and I'm a bit of a leech, really. Um, you kind of take the mixture of equipment, different cameras, different lenses, whatever, and you kind of sort of suck out the, what's the environment, what's their thought process, 
and somehow uh, a kind of concept or what, what tool are you going to use to, to show what's going on? So I've got um, oh, some, an artist that Julie shares some studio space with, uh, Michael here, who's lying on the floor of his studio. I just discovered his work through your picture. And it's, and it's great stuff. And there, there are a few of his pictures he's lying in, and they're very kind of intense, kind of, they, they kind of embody the thoughts that you feel are going on in, in his head. And then his studio space is like, Chaos. chaos. <laughs> and it kind of felt like there's a sort of quiet sense with all these things going on in his mind that then gets embodied within his pictures. Yes. It makes my studio look tiny. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, that's nice, sorry. And, and then Lucy, um, she had quite a nice tidy studio, but she was very much on the little photograph. Don't, don't, don't photograph me. Was sort of the, the shtick. So the, the things seemed just completely natural to wrap her up in a, in a work in progress. So this was kind of painted and printed canvas that she then used in our So artworks. what's the collaboration between you and well, It's kind of not. It's kind of sucking up what they feel like, but then you kind of flip and go, well, I think it's going to look like this. So how about if you did that? And, and some of these, Julie was actually came along as well, and she, she knew that some of the artists better, so she'd have a bit of an idea like, They'll do that. They want to do that. We work uh, with Michael here, and he makes um, kind of masks. What is one of the things he does? It's out of plastic hairpins and child's toys that he then sprays uh, with metallic kind of paints. Um, that's in his. He works in a, his bedroom, um, and it's a tiny, tiny, you know, about yes. as big as what you can see on the on the camera here. Um, and this was he was. In his bed, on his bed, in his underpants. So there was nothing, no clothes that might get show. And I'm standing above him on the bed, almost falling over. And, and I just met him. And I just met him. <laughs> <laughs> we were trying to get him to run down the street naked with my crown face mask on. But he was having none of that. So that's as close as we get. And that was, look, everything's kind of out of focus except your feet and his eyes in, in that one. Um, and the, so the last one is, is Pia, um, she works in her home, um, and this is a, a, a kind of a front room, but it's through the episode, it's like a huge room, you know, two rooms of it on the ground floor. And her partner works at the back, he's a musician, so he's got a studio and lots of computers. And on the other end, it's kind of this complicated books, inspiration, little sculptures, all sorts of things. But she just kind of appeared as like a kind of Kind of renaissance kind of mm. dutch master kind of air about her mm. and some of her work kind of fits up that concept so it seems natural that she would take a very sort of posed thing and, so and have you thought about doing a self-portrait as well of, of you as the artist well or is it, i've got a really got a studio i've got a boring apple mac and a rack of cds behind me right but so then, yeah you don't need a lot of space so it's really <laughs> So somebody else can come and take my picture. Yeah. <laughs> how, how, do you find your, how do you find your subjects? Um, how do they find you? Um, some I bumped into. Um, some I was photographing at different spaces. And they, they, there are a few places that have artist studios as part of the complex. I might be photographing something here in a day. It's like, oh, there's an artist pop up there. Julie's been wonderful. She knows every artist south of the river. So she you've was quite. Four, you've got four new ones here. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's just like, you know, most artists have got something interesting about them. But if they don't have anything interesting about them, it's great. Let's make a really boring it's photo. It's quite nice to come without knowing exactly what you yeah. want to do. And, I, I, and then one, one mission we did eight. <laughs> Julie was directing me to the different studios. And I was driving, so I got all the pressure of parking and everything. And we would leap, literally leap out of the car with a bag of cameras and kind of, oh, let's see the channel. Oh, yes, that's a next one. Yes. And we were, that was, uh, yeah. Yes. And you can't really it. plan anything in a way, can you? It's all no. kind of organic about what It's know. really brave. <laughs> but I think that the other thing that's, you. <laughs> but I think that, that gives the work a real energy because it's not pre planned yeah. yeah. And, and and I think that he, he I think it shows Peter's vision and real skill. as a skill to be able to to take, oh I can see, you know, Lucy would do this, so I need to be able to show 
you know, to, to give a dialogue of the artist's practice in just one shot. Yeah, yeah what I like about this, I mean, there's so many of these um, beautiful artist studio things that you come across your art, artist studio books and artist studio. You know, it always breaks my heart because, you know, here I am in a little corner. <laughs> that, that, whereas what you've done is uh, you've made a completely new artwork of an artist in their space. And it's, it's that kind of that space, that energy that they occupy that you've actually turned into your own artwork, which I really like. Thank you very much. That's and what we're trying to do. And, and what do you think, like we were saying about Lucy, maybe, you know, to push her practice further, maybe supplying the story as well. How, what, where do you see the project going? Do you imagine it to be an exhibition or do you imagine it to be a book? Or do you, have you had, have you thought that far or not? And <clears throat> it, it would be nice to be a book, but uh, there are lots, you know, who, who, who would buy the book. It would be nice to have a book. Who would buy the book? Well, um, yeah, so everyone the artists. <laughs> 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 you just get lots of artists. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, oh, but I'll make, you know. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you don't have to think about who the audience is. I think you have to think about what you want to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it an ongoing project? Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, yeah. How, long, <laughs> how many artists have you had? Uh, so probably about 20 or so okay. now, um, and some repeated them, because they keep changing their studios. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I keep changing my studios. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice look, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I don't know, it's a great idea, and I think the, the, the photographs speak for themselves, they're beautiful, and I think they encapsulate the moment in time as well. So I, I think that, that you should just go for it. And it wouldn't just be the artists and their families wanting to do it. I think, you know, anyone that, that does beautiful oh, photography but, has all well, uh, But again, I think that this, and the, it needs a little interview story thing as well. Mm -hmm. Like, just like your own your pieces need the backstory. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe that's something that you can start, like, putting together. Yeah, yeah. Would you do it or would you work with somebody else that does words? I kind of think because I did words as well. So, oh, okay. Yeah, so. Okay. It's an all rounder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and also, the ones you've already photographed would be actually quite interesting to go, to go back, back to them and, and then and have the global. And the last man's got a few stories. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and he's kind of changed what he does now, hasn't he? He's it? it's, it's evolved into doing some other things. And performance. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. That's what you were doing. So. Oh, yeah. That was his performance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Paula, can we talk about yours? Yes, we can. Shall I show you? Yes, please. Yes. yes. Um, so this is just the last thing that I've been making in the studio. So it's it's um, it's an actual hanky, and it was recently the hanky that belonged to my dad, and he died in March. And me and him didn't always see eye to eye. We didn't have a fantastic relationship. Um, and I sort of noticed this thing, it happened when my father-in-law died actually, that um, his handkerchiefs got distributed throughout the family and I was thinking that was a lovely keepsake but a very quiet thing to have, very personal thing to have of someone. And then the same thing happened when my dad died, my mum gave initially to my brother a big stack of his freshly mauled handkerchiefs and my brother wasn't really, he just sort of took them to be polite. And I thought, <laughs> and I didn't know immediately what I was going to do with them, but I just knew that there was something, there was just something about them that I wanted. So have you done similar things on other fabrics or, or is it no, just... No, I've never done anything just like this before. I do quite often combine text with everyday objects. Um, I've stamped coins before, bought the one each. There's a little present oh, 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 ongoing series, possibly the biggest, smallest piece of work I've ever made. Mm. Um, yeah. And it, it's That's 50 awesome. pieces stamped with the slogan, Equal Pay for Women. And I stamp them by the hundred and then just pass them out and spend them. And I once had one shot. It's just as I find them. So, you haven't especially published that. No, no, no. And I, I, I don't know why I told you, but I once had one given back to me 
It was either like Sainsbury's in Dog Hill Hill or, <laughs> or it was a shop in Campbell. And I can't quite remember, but I remember being so excited. Yeah. So yeah, I quite often will combine text or slogans or something with a, an item. So it seems it seemed particularly appropriate to embroider my dad's hankies. Um and so then I was very quickly coming up with quite snarky comments, but that Refer to some of his what I consider to be poor life choices, or you know, sort of characteristics of, of him or sort of facets of our relationship. Maybe say more about me than him. I'm not sure, but I've, I've still got quite a few left, and I've still got quite a few things that I'd like to add. But it's a very slow process, and it's, it's kind of turned out to be less a labour of love and more a labour of disdain. <laughs> but it is. <laughs> It's very cathartic, mm -hmm. it's sitting, embroidering. Is it like a embroidering by hand? Yeah, so it's yeah. All, all just slowly in an embroidery ring sat in the studio. It's, it's, very, 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 it's very fun, isn't it? Yeah. You must have really great fun stuff. What, what, are some of the, what, what are some of the messages that you embroidered? Um, well, this, this is sort of a more, more generic kind of, I was thinking about hanky, and, you know, the use of time not in a hanky is a way of remembering to do something. People that have hanky then. Um, so I'll try the knot in that. Um, embroidered the word forgive with a question mark. So it's like forgive, but not forget. Okay. So that one. Um, there's one here that says, thank you, thank oh, you. Mm. Um, my dad was a mechanic. There's one that says absolute spanner. <laughs> and most of his tools came from Snap-on. So I took their font and then embroidered a Swiss army knife, which he also always had on him. It's a total tool. Um, so, yeah, I haven't told my mum. So I actually oh, don't check it. <laughs> 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 I hope you don't want to. But yeah, so that, that's that's what I've been doing. So, um, and I feel like I've sort of been the last laugh in a very quiet, very small way that so feels like well, there's something to just I, I mean i love hanky as well i've always loved especially white hankies there's something kind of i don't know there's something just so pure and so simple and so awesome about it i've also got kind of family anecdotes and yeah. there's always the hanky and the watch on my hands i think it's the watch um but there's something special about a hanky there's a lot of kind of mythology myth, uh, myth sort of stuff about uh Things like ladies used to drop out yeah. of the cheek, didn't they? To yeah. to you know, to see if a gentleman would pick it up, and, or waving handkerchiefs as a surrender thing, and all that. So they kind of almost I'm got embroidering one like that with lots of synonyms, synonyms for surrender. Right, so right. It's less about my dad, although it is about my dad. Um, but it's everything but the words. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. So it's got a lot of resonance. Yeah, I, mean, I think lots of objects have they lots do. of yeah. backstory before you then layer yeah. in what you want on them as well, like Marmaduke. Mm -hmm. yeah. But could, could you consider, because I've got a couple of people creation of all the hankies <coughs> and I'm trying to Why this still, I mean, it's, it's precious and it's the bottom of my drawer, and it's in those flat boxes, it almost looks like chocolate boxes, mm -hmm. but they're flat and they're beautifully folded, mm -hmm. and um, I think it's still pinned, and then some are just obviously old, and I've ironed them and folded. Um, would you move once you've done all the parental hankies? Are you going to move on to maybe sourcing old hankies? Um, I don't know. I mean, it, I think I never know when something's finished. I mean, yeah. like the 50p pieces, I imagine I'll be stamping them for as long as any circulation. Mm -hmm. I can't have too many sort of call to arms out there in the world. Yeah. Can you? Um, I'd be really delighted to get one back in my chair. Mm. Then I'd feel like I'd done enough, maybe. But I don't know. And I sort of feel like there's still some more, but you know, you've got. To but, but, but I think isn't the isn't <coughs> the relationship to your father that they're your father's handkerchiefs? Yeah. That's that's what's <coughs> important because I, I, you seem with your practice to respond to materials like I, I, 
you know, like, do you have the idea and then look for the material, or does the material come first and then you work out the idea? Um, um, most of those, I think, like the 50p piece idea was an idea before I had the tools to make it. I had to find a set of letter punches and an anvil to sit and literally just hammer the, the words into the coins. But I remember getting the idea. And, and was the idea about the words and then you decided, this is the words I want to say, where can I say the words? Um, I suppose, well, yeah, it was the words first, and then I very deliberately chose a 50p coin because it was, you know, half a pound and it had, and I always stamped the same across the Queen's face. Um, and yeah, so it was, it's quite a deliberate sort of putting together of various aspects of that. So they're all different, but they're all similar, you know, they're all consistent. You can literally yeah. stamp every letter yeah. Yeah. it's amazing. It could take you a long time. Um, so you, so you can line them up on the anvil and you can <laughs> make <laughs> several of them. So do you do all the E's at the same time? Yeah. 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 And I think if, don't they say that in November, there's a date in November until January that women then work for free yeah. for that entire time because yeah. that is the pay gap. Yeah, it's still, I mean, and that was part of the inspiration. I'd, I'd heard on Radio 4 um, the Neil McGregor series about the history of the world in 100 objects, and he referred to the, the penny, the old penny that the suffragettes defaced. And I went to see it in the British Museum, and I thought it was an amazing thing, very simple, very small protest. And I thought that was really clever. And then, not long after that, I remember seeing the film Building Dagenham. Which was a fantastic film, really uplifting, really funny, really great. And then I was thinking, hold oh, on a minute, that was in 1970. And we still, in fact, it's probably the gender pay gap is probably worse now than it was then. And so I just thought, well, that's not okay. And then, you know, the idea for updating the suffragette mm -hmm. came into it. Mark, do you want to talk to us about your um, yeah. work? Um, Show the camera. <laughs> this is uh, a painting that I'm working on at the moment. It's actually not quite finished. And it's taken from a Polaroid that I took um, back in about 1980. Um, I'm currently doing a series of works, um, painting up pictures from photographs that I took back then. I think like everybody here uh, tonight, I'm kind of obsessed with, with people faces with humans. I think we're all pretty much share the same sort Absolutely, of thing. Absolutely, yes. Um, uh, and we're all figurative sort of artists, which I love. Um, and I love the fact that figurative painting is actually back on radar uh, in the art world because it's been, it, it was kind of out of fashion for a long time. Um, I was a teenage city stardust back in 1972 and completely fell for the whole Bowie ethos of people reinventing themselves uh, and creating characters out of themselves that they might, that perhaps society didn't, uh, wouldn't have ex expected them to be. Um, so kind of self-invented self identities. Um, so I've always been attracted to people with very strong, exaggerated um, images. Uh, and so when I came to London in the late 70s, I gravitated towards the club scene, the blitz scene, and started painting people like um, Boy George, Steve Strange, uh, all those people who were also, they were all also kind of operating on from, they were all Bowie fans as well. So it was this whole thing that had started about um, people reinventing themselves as fantastic characters to live out uh, a life, a fantasy life that they wanted to live, which was perhaps um, outside of outside of what would be expected of them. And when was the <coughs> term famous for 15 minutes? Um, when, when did that come in? Was, you know, like Andy War was famous, but was that before or? That was in the, I think that was in the, uh, that was in, I think the late 60s. Oh, okay, 70s, yeah. So then, where, even though the, all the sort of Blitz ones were just trying to be famous, weren't they? Oh, yeah. Everybody in the Blitz was, they would have killed each other just to get, you know, a, a mention in the gossip column. You know, everyone thinks that it was a very friendly, 
community thing, and they all loved each other. Now they didn't. There were people that didn't speak to each other for 10 years because they've got someone copy their hairstyles. So how jealous were they that Steve Frank ended up being in the Bowie video? Oh, God, everyone was absolutely <laughs> furious, including George. And he, he always says that that was what inspired him to actually get it together and have a band. He couldn't bear the fact that Steve was on top of, his nemesis was on top of the box. And, and, and how do you, what, what medium do you use to do your painting? Um, yeah, it's, it's all an acrylic and it's all, um, I kind of, over the years, I've kind of honed my technique too much and I'm actually trying to break out. I mean, it's what I love about your painting because the paint, the handling of the paint is gorgeous. I'm trying to break out from making everything razor sharp, pin sharp, flat. I learned so much. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, it's, it up yeah. Well. I mean, you look at these pictures and, and it's about, for me, these are not about famous people. These are about gorgeous paint. Yeah. You know, the fact that they are famous people. Um, and, and Inga, um, the way that you paint, yeah. um, um, how, how, where do, where do the ideas come from? Um, they normally come in a very, it's a very a visual form. And I, I, it's the kind of thing that for years I thought that I really needed to have a concept or an idea first. And I, I you know, I realized over the years that falls flat in such a big way. So how I come with ideas is I have a very visual idea and I work towards it. I completely trust I trust the visual idea, I follow it, and it, it And do you make photographs first? I, I, I do photographs, I, I look for whatever props I need. If I don't, if I can't find a prop with a costume or something, I need to make it, that's so up stuff. Um, uh, so I find everything that I need. I like to do a lot of sketches in order to kind of like solidify the, the compositional idea. Um, and then then I'll, I'll set it up, pose the whole thing, take photographs and then paint it. Um, yeah. Painting from Polaroids. Yeah. Um, what 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 made you? How did you get the inspiration to think I need to make a reproduction of a work that was already that you'd made? So you've already made the Polaroid yourself. Yeah. Why not? Why why repaint? Why make a painting? I really like the idea of taking something really small because also a, a, a lot of stuff that I do, I'll take I'll get like a picture from a really badly printed tiny picture from a gossip column or something and I like the idea of taking something like that and creating it into uh, transforming it into like a large piece um, obviously with Polaroids they're fairly good quality anyway but I like the flatness um, and I was like a lot of people when I was a teenager I was kind of very into the Warhol thing and my kind of look uh, a lot of the finishes that I have, people think it looks quite flat. I mean, it is quite flat because what I do is I, I, I'll, I'll paint all my flat colours in, in acrylic and then all my shading, I've developed this technique where I kind of, it's almost like a dry brush, like putting makeup on. So you can build up like, um, almost like an airbrush kind of look, but they're very, very flat. And I'm, I keep trying to break out of that kind of mental, I've painted myself into this thing of trying to make everything very sort of perfect, which I'm trying to get out of. Um, so I'm using more oil paint now and less of the acrylic stuff because uh, it's just, it, 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 it's sort of better for getting more of a, less of a sort of screen printed look. What, a lot of what kind of scale is that? It's, it's about that big. Okay. Yeah, so it's not huge. I mean, it's not, not amongst the biggest sort of pieces that I've done. But I do like working large. The only trouble is you have to store them all, you know. And I mean, my studio is a decent size, but it's not that big to, you know, where you, to, to sort of keep a lot of big works. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, yeah, so I, t I'm t I tend to kind of work, average size I work is about that, is a comfortable size to me. Mm -hmm. I don't really like working too small, although I am working on, I'm doing a book at the moment, um, which is going to be a coffee table book. So I was obsessed with Cracked Actor, the David Bowie documentary, uh, for many years. And um, I've written a book with an American writer called Susan Compo, who wrote a book about the man who fell to earth. 
uh, and I went visited the BBC archives and got their mm -hmm. um, the 1975 Cracked Actor um, file, production file, which details every shot that was filmed that was never used. Are there more tracks? Are there more live tracks? Uh, there's interview. There's long interviews with David Bowie and whatever were transcribed that had never made it into the program. So uh, we've written this book, and I'm illustrating it with a lot of artworks because there's not an awful lot of visual mm. stuff that, that survives from that. So um, at the moment, I'm I'm sort of doing kind of some paintings that are going to be book illustrations. So I'm doing not working to such a large scale on those. But yeah, I mean, I you know, in my fantasy, I, I, I would like to be a lot freer and not do that. But it's like a really weird yeah. mental thing to break out of. Yeah, maybe it's, that's your, maybe that's your thing. And you, I know, maybe and you're it not is. meant to break yeah, out. Yeah, maybe I'm not meant to. That's, that's kind of, you, you kind of think that. And it's, Quite often, I don't know if anyone here has the same thing. When I'm sort of halfway through a painting or something, everyone says, oh no, it looks great. Oh, Leave it like that. All the time. And it's like, no. <laughs> yeah. uh, and it's really difficult because you know that it looks great, but it's just knowing when to start. So how comes people see your work in progress? As a well, sometimes I post piece. stuff that I'm working, right. well, quite often I post stuff on, on Facebook and Instagram and stuff right. like that because people like to see, mm. people are quite interested in a progression. Yes. So what I'm doing, I'm starting to do some more videoing of stuff to start like a YouTube channel so I can sort of demonstrate how I do this because people are always like, oh, how do you do that and how do you do that and how long does this take and whatever. So. Uh, people seem to be quite interested. I don't know if you yeah. probably get that as well. Yeah, I, I, you know. I put my foot down and go that I just don't do. You don't do. Uh, <laughs> and I, yeah, it's just like I, I'll show the in progress. Right. Um, but I, yeah, I don't want to show. I don't want to be a teacher. No, mm -hmm. oh, I don't want to be a teacher. No, no. Yeah. But but I don't want to. But I don't. I don't even. I don't want to even describe my process. Right. Okay. Uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How to do. Is that because yeah. you want to protect it? You oh no, not at own. all. No, it's just not something. I think. I, I think the way that I work is more organic. Mm -hmm. um, the, so I, I don't know whether there's a you know there's a step by step process. Right. It's quite okay. A because I've I've done that kind of thing where I've I've had to. You know, do lots of live demonstrations and mm. being asked, and there's part of it that's really lovely, and it feels really, it f it feels like a wonderful, generous process where you're actually sharing. And you kind of, you know, when you, when you verbalize something, and you go, oh, actually, this is what I'm doing. I, I never really realized it, but now that I'm saying it, this and this and this. But when I'm painting alone and I'm just painting, I very often think to myself, I'm so glad I don't have to explain this to anyone right mm -hmm. now. Because I'm, I'm talking to myself in my head all the time, you know, I, I verbalise my you know, yes. the whole process. And it's so nice to just do it in my head. And, and then you, yeah. you, you were on um, the portraits um, programme on, on Sky Art. So how, how was it having people come up to you and talk to you about what you were doing at the time? You know, it's a bit like Bake Off, isn't it? Mm -hmm. it's, 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 completely, it's like Bake Off when you paint. And it's really, it's really strange. And you, you uh, I mean, you're busy painting and you kind of go, oh, the green, that's not so good. I've got some red here. And then someone comes, I see you've changed that. Uh, How do you feel about that? <laughs> it's when it, it's it's when it, it's it. It's when it goes wrong, isn't it? That's when you don't want them to see. Yes. In, um, it, I had an exhibition in 1983 and the, the, the lady that did PR for Japan, because I was friendly with David Sylvian, she got me onto the tube, this program called the tube, yeah, and David was gonna. I was gonna be have to paint David uh, live on the tube, but wow. he he dropped out of course. Yeah. So uh, Connie got Hazel O'Connor. So I had to paint Hazel O'Connor supposedly live on the tube. Of course, I'd drawn it all very faintly out, you know. Yes. I, and I had this, and I was doing paintings at the time where I was painting like in gloss black on a matte black background so that you've got like um, charm, negative yes, or yes. positive or blue on blue, red on red. So I was doing a blue on blue of Hazel O'Connor and the studio lights, all my paint was melting oh, yeah. and it was all running and, and of course Paul Yates and <laughs> were not in this way and yeah. running not in a good way and so the presenters were going, oh it's looking really great and I'm thinking no it doesn't, it looks really terrible and it, I was just wanted the floor to open up, I just thought this is terrible and 
there's a clip of it on you on YouTube from this program, and you can see me painting, and you see like this paint running oh. down from oh, the eyes. It's, it's just it's like just awful. Just don't show you anymore. I don't let anyone in. I'm absolutely You're nobody sees. Work. Nobody gets comment partway through. Julie, Julie how yeah, sorry. Well, yeah, yeah, so how, really how, how controlled is your uh, are your is your is it completely uncontrolled or do you kind of slightly control your drips? Do oh, the drips are not controlled in any way. But then I will decide whether I keep, keep drip them. Up. Right, okay. And so, um, but I spend more time deciding where the paint goes than actually applying the paints. So I will actually make right. one mark and then step away probably for at least 10 or 15 minutes deciding where the next mark goes. Right. And then when that drip happens I then have to make a quick decision of whether am I keeping that drip and if I am where's the counteraction of balance of the next mark going to be to to balance the piece and is this how you work normally as in you've got multiple you know I came to see about a week ago and you had I think Andy was just starting and do you kind of keep leaping from one to another and re-evaluating and Yes, yeah. And what is it? Is it oil paints or is it acrylic? Or it's household gloss. It's household gloss. Oh, okay, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, but with this residency, I've decided to change my medium to water based household gloss right. because I've been working with oil based. Even though water based household gloss is still oil, it's water based. But so, <laughs> so, but I, I've just the environmental impact mm. of my materials, you know, I, you know, I'm vegetarian, I think about what kind of car I drive, mm. I, you know, I try and think about my recycle, you know, I constantly try and think, yeah. there's me painting with household gloss that smells appalling mm. and is so <coughs> oil based that I just was just like, I really need to change my medium. So I thought with this residency, I would move to water base as an experiment. And yeah. as a positive. Yes, okay. fantastic. And, and I don't think that you can really see any difference no. between it being no, water based and. Well, so Why, which one is water based? They're, they're all water based. Oh, these are all water based? Yes. Oh, right, okay. Just, I would never have thought that. So, mm -hmm. so are the, the NHS. No, they're that, all that's all the. Well. Yes. Yeah. Do, you, do, you have, um, do you get feedback from the people that you paint? I mean, I'm not talking about these guys. <laughs> well, you might not. <laughs> yeah, let's remember what they think. <laughs> Tracy, for example. Uh, I I haven't uh, contacted Tracy, uh, uh, but yes, you know some, you know like George, I've contacted and he was very pleased with his. So if I was Tracy, I'd be so chuffed yeah, with that. It's just stunning. You just yeah, captured really her good. so perfectly. She's got that. She, well, she's got a fantastic face, hasn't she? Yeah, she, she says it with so much character. And a, a not approachable kind of person, you know, and she's just got so much an amazing attitude. You obviously must know the, uh, the story that she was a teenage culture club fan that followed George around. No, didn't you? No. Oh, oh. yeah, yeah, no. George said Tracy Emin was like, uh, I think she was like thirteen or something, and was a massive culture club fan, and literally used to hang, used to like. Uh, um, basically, yeah. stalk George. Yes. Yeah. So you've been like, you probably elbowed her out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I met her a couple of times when I was at college because I studied at Camberwell and she had a show at the South London Gallery, which is literally just yeah. next door. And it was her first kind of solo show because she used to have a uh, the Tracy Emin Museum, which was yeah. literally like one block from here right. uh, in Blackfriars. And I used to go past on the bus, and you could see her painting in the window, and I'd watch her every day. Making the bed. Yeah, well, yeah. And she had a tent. She was sewing the names inside the tent, inside the shop in Waterloo. And, um, yeah, so I kind of sort of followed her. But, yeah, with the, the South London Gallery show that um, I went to see, and I bumped into her there, and she was like, oh, come to heaven, and, uh, and gave me the ticket for the opening show and stuff. But, yeah, I don't know her. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so can can I just ask you? Like, yes. Can we talk about how, how yes. long does that? That I mean, is that finished? It's a long time finished now. Um, this I I actually had it a couple of years and it was 
it had been in a kind of a finished state for a couple of years already. Yeah, I've even had a well, how, how big, how, how big it's a, this is a meter and a half by a meter, so it's about yeah, 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 yeah. 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 it's a nice, comfortable size because you travel around. Yeah, yeah. Just, I love that. I love that journey thing. Anyway, it was um, I had it up on a, in a, a group show once a couple of years ago. Um, they were overhearing people walking past saying, "It's very dramatic." I never put it on my wall though. Um, <laughs> but I, I was looking at you know I'd, I'd hang things up. I hang things up next to the table so I can just like look there, look at the painting, and just gaze at them. And it just bothered me so much for years. And then I put it away. Then look at it. And then I pulled it out because I loved something about it. I just loved her so much. It's just something so regal and so hopeful about her. Do you find what I find? I've, I've, I've done that. I've pulled out works that I've been so bored with when I finished them. I don't want to see them anymore. I think they're no good. And you pull them away sometimes for years. And I've done that recently. I found a couple of things. thought, wow, I really like this. It's just like really <laughs> great, you know. And I couldn't bear it at the time because you've spent... That's You've spent time on them and you've been obsessed and it hasn't come out exactly as you kind of thought it was going to do and you didn't really like it. But then after not seeing it for like a period of time, suddenly you see it in a different way. And, and I just, I feel like I, I've grown so much as an artist. I mean, I feel like in the last, maybe even in the last year, I've learned so many practical, physical skill things that... Um, you know, they just and they they get as you get older. I think you kind of your your momentum is a little bit faster. So I looked at this and I just thought you can be rescued, and I effectively repainted the whole thing. I just right. felt like poor brush strokes and like impoverished surface, and it was just kind of icky and scratchy. And so it wasn't that you looked at it and you thought this thing needs some antlers, and that well, it had antlers, but it had rubbish antlers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, antlers. A new stone, well, it's actually two stones put together, um, and just a lovely thick paint. And so there's clearly a lot of narrative in your work. Yeah. So does, is that is that part? Of it's definitely part of it. It's all. It's all. Um, my, my paintings are all. I mean, you're you're all talking about you talking about the little grainy photograph. Yeah. I often take photographs of television or films. Yes. Yeah. Because they are so exquisite. Yeah. They're like no art that I could ever yeah. make. That lighting, the composition. And then I always think, maybe I should paint it. And I never ever do, because it just feels it's not me, it's not my stuff, it just doesn't uh, connect with it. I used to take Polaroids from the TV, you yeah. know, years mm -hmm. ago, and I've, I've still got a few, whatever, because it's, just, it's, it's just something about them, they look so great. And <laughs> like you, have, I've always thought, oh, I'd paint that. But in a way, it would be really difficult to, to actually, um, to, to actually recreate it. Yeah, and, you I, know, I have really tried, and it just, it's not, it's, there's no connection. It's no. Just not, it was beautiful, and I wanted to live it. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, what I like is the idea, I love the idea of a film still where there's a whole collapsed narrative. Right. Um, like, uh, uh, I, feel like, I think it was Paula Rago who said it. Um, I think it was her <coughs> this quote, but she used the word simultaneousness. It was such a lovely word because she was talking about that whole. As you know, you've said her name. I can really see a connection oh, with her work. I can oh. So I, I love the idea of something's about to happen. Something's just happened. There's this kind of a narrative tension. Um, plus, I I love the idea of some great, completely fictional allegory, as if it's you know, like you made up stories with the figurines. I, I make up. Do you get people? Do you get people that come up with their own interpretations oh, of what's yes. happening? Which must yes. be interesting because my work's not really like that. But there are some things that I've done where people say, "Oh, I see that's this, that, and everything. It's not at all, but it's so interesting to hear another, yeah. another that's person's it. kind of Im impression of what you're that's doing. So you I must get it really a lot because a lot. there's I such do. a lot to read and into. I love that because I, I do think there's a there's a huge aspect if you get the viewer or you buy a painting or something. You are in, in effect taking your own baggage, your own history, and you're recreating an artwork with your own understanding. Um, but someone recently, I had a painting where I have uh, like a, a silk eye mask, like just to you know be able to sleep until six o'clock. Kind of so eye mask, and then a little bird just fluttering around the head. And she said, "Oh, I saw that painting about COVID." No, yes. Um, you know, so in my, in my head it was a completely different mm -hmm. tangent. Um, what made her, her come to that conclusion? 
Kardashian? Uh, I think she's one of she's she's particularly outraged about masks and kind of you know strictures right. about it and stuff. So maybe she she immediately projected yeah. her own. <coughs> so <coughs> have, you, have you had that like with your work that like time has put another layer of I meaning? I a few years ago. Sorry, but it's like it's a um, uh, Frida Kahlo ish with my husband's eyes, but with a big. Um, mm-hmm. leather boutique on yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then lots of flowers and a bird again, another little blue bird. So it's it's a mixture of this kind of slightly threatening, you know, leather bondage y thing with like lots of flowers and things. But it was about three years prior to um, twenty twenty. So So it's a plague mask that we used hey, to wear. Yeah. Yeah. It, it looks like a bit more Say they're masochistic, but, like, <laughs> uh, but you know, yeah. um, maybe that You're says more about me. But how do you wake up in the morning and think I'm going to put, you know, antlers on myself? You know, where, do, where does this inspiration come? I don't know. That's the thing that I find very hard to explain because that's the thing that just happens visually. Yeah. I look at it and I go. So you form a you form almost like a finished version of that mm-hmm. image in your mind mm-hmm. and then you create it and yeah. make it and, and collage sometimes it's so fuzzy yeah. sometimes it's quite fuzzy and I have to go do lots of doodles where I go what's that what is what am I seeing you know it's, mm-hmm. I mean it sounds it sounds more mystical than it is it's just kind of like I, I did a painting a couple of years ago where this woman had to have blinkers like horses and donkeys have blinkers when they pull a cart um I wasn't sure why, but it compositionally everything, it was essential, it had to be there. I had to go find the livery store, find the thinkers, and you know, years later I was talking to a, a, someone who came to an exhibition who explained to me why, why it needed blinkers, and it was, you know, yes, it was true, that, you know, the interpretation was completely spot on. But and yeah, what did they say? say? What did they say about the um, it, they said, I mean, there was a kind of a feminist leaning, and it was a little bit tongue in cheek because the painting called the backseat driver and she had kind of war medals and you know but she was she was fun in the backseat and um and these blinkers and he explained to me that it is it's blinkering her from being watched and being viewed and being you know gazed upon yeah. mm. um which i quite liked she was yeah. just looking just forward and just yeah but it's fantastic how the inspiration comes to you whilst you're working that, you yeah. know, the, the, the narrative comes... But it's something you need to learn to trust, because I think I, I spent so many years trying to have an idea and then work from an idea, and it's just the worst, awful experience where it just it falls so flat. I mean, I do have ideas as well, and then I scribble those down, and loads of those. I don't, I'm very, fair, very seldom would execute those. Yeah. Um, but it's to trust that visual... Mm. Idea. Yeah, like I, I, I think that, like I said, with, with my practice, that, that I'll, I'll, I'll come up with the idea and then think, what do I want to say? And then I'll probably make loads of kind of Photoshop composites and collages and lists, so many lists mm. and, and so much sort of scrapbook things. So what's on the list? I can imagine a scrapbook with pictures. Oh, the, the, the list of a list of like, or who is my favourite music icons? Who are my art icons? Who, you know, who do I want to spend time with? You know, say, you know, a painting maybe takes two weeks or something. So I feel like I'm spending two weeks with that person. Mm-hmm. And, and and I actually read about them and imagine them as I'm... Do you listen to music? Yes, definitely. So you definitely connect with the, the person as you are recreating mm. them. Do you yes. listen to music as well? Are you always, them, always. Yeah. And yeah. is it related to the image? No, not at all, no, no, no not... More often than not, it's not. I mean, I basically in the studio, I have BBC Six Music on the radio mm-hmm. station. So I mean, you never really know what's what's going to play. Do you know what's, what's the only problem with that is that I find like I get so distracted. If there's a song that I like, I don't know who it is, and I have to stop, and then I have to find out who it is. <laughs> I know, but well, I just keep shazamming stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I used to. I mean, I, you can't do it now. They've stopped I, iTunes. Um, but I used to like. I'd go home every night with a list of things and just go on iTunes, and I used to think this is great because back in the 70s or 80s if you heard something on the radio you liked it could take you weeks to find yeah. it you know, yeah, you'd record. go into the record shop and sing you'd the song have to sing it. Yeah, yeah. I, did that. I did that in Soho once for this dance track I'd heard 
I was on drugs in this club and it sounded fantastic and yeah. this is the best thing I've ever heard. What was it? It was called, uh, I've got a really weird story about this, it was called <laughs> Dirty Talk and it yeah, was by Climbing MBO. 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 <laughs> and, yeah, and it's quite obscure, isn't it? He's probably got the twelve. It, it was very big in Leeds. It was, it was, <laughs> yeah, well, I heard it in this club in London, and the DJ didn't really want to tell me what it was, and I was on drugs, and I couldn't really remember, so I had to go around the record shops, kind of trying to remember what it was like. Eventually, in one of them, quite, yeah. a guy told me. Now, I bought it, and of course, when I heard it sober, <laughs> it wasn't really as fantastic as I thought it was. So I played it a few times and put it in a box, and this was like maybe 86 or something like that, 87. And about, this was about three or four years ago, or maybe a bit longer. I hadn't played it since. I hadn't heard it on the radio. I hadn't, hadn't even thought about it. And one morning I woke up and I just had the title of it going around in my head. And I got up and I had a cup of tea and a piece of toast. And I'm thinking, why am I thinking about this record? Why? It's really weird. Why am I thinking about it? And it, it was so definite, this thought in my head. I was like thinking, I don't know why I'm thinking about this record. I went around to my studio, I put Radio 6 Music on, mm -hmm. and Lauren Laverne's programme, she did this thing where people did their five records or something, just in time, saying the next record is Dirty Talk by Klein and MBO. And I, I had to sit down, I just thought, I can't believe that. It was so I bizarre. Did you email Lauren? Lauren, this is just happening. No, but I wrote in to my friend who was an art director for 14 times, mm -hmm. and I wrote in to 14 mm -hmm. times the, this, this thing, and they published it because I just could not believe it. I just I couldn't believe it, and I still weird. kind of can't. It's, weird. it's, weird. it's like it's the. Brilliantly weird, though, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it's really is good. It's great. Does dirty well. talk an inspiration for a painting? Wouldn't that, that, that would be a great painting? D dirty talk. Yeah, I mean, I never really thought about it like that, like that, but yeah, it would be. Yeah. We can all use dirty talk as an inspiration. Yes. So I, I think that we should draw this to a close. Yes. Yeah. And I'm very, very grateful for all of you being here. It's been fun. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. 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 Who are the organisers? Uh, Degree Art, Contemporary Collective, and Bankside Hotel. And well, thanks, Julia. Thank you. Thank you.